University of Advancement and was later named the Vice President. He is married to the former Marla Ledbetter of Hackleburg, Alabama for 26 years. And Philip and Marla have two children, Kayla and Preston. In addition to his work with Heritage Christian, Philip serves as interim ministry for congregations and preachers in several gospel meetings each year. Without further ado, I feel it. Yes, the old bio sheet. Well, you travel and congregations say, send us your bio, so you kind of have to have one, and so uh, that's it. And uh, I'm thankful to be here tonight. Let me get organized a little bit. I've told the guys I'm going to try not to spit on them because I'd hate to run them off the second row. It's really good that they're down here. Love the format change. Uh, speakers love it when they actually get to end, you know, extend the invitation after they've spoken. And uh, so very thankful for that change tonight, and, and we'll adjust to that on the fly here as we go. All right. Let's see, we can skip that slide. Um, commercial, Heritage Event, August 23rd. Uh, some of you all have contacted me, but uh, let me know if we need to get you set up. That'll be here before we know it. going to be a big night, and some of you all are involved every year, and we love that. Uh, that's today's number, and that number is on the screen because today Marla has been putting up with me for that many years. And uh, so I say that, and I'm thankful to her and to the family because my ministry is a little bit different. It's on the road a lot, and they allow me to do that, and so I'm very thankful. But 26, to me, uh, is a significant number, and so I wanted to mention that uh, tonight. So let's start talking about theistic evolution. Joe was telling me out in the lobby a few minutes ago that um, he saw something online, and, and it may have been an autocorrect because a lot of times our phones don't like words that we don't use very often, uh, but he saw where something had been posted and it said theatric evolution. And in some ways, maybe it is theatrics because it takes some changing and some playing around and some messing around to get to the point uh, that you would deal with some of the things that we're going to deal with tonight. One of the big questions for me, and, and maybe you can identify with this, is I think back to being younger and as I think back to some of what I went through, one of the questions is, how can so many highly educated people be wrong? Isn't that really one of the things that creates doubt within us? It was for me, as I think back through my years of being younger and maybe some of those moments where I'm being bombarded with all this different information, you know, that's one of the things that would come to mind. You know, I'm being told that all these things are so and they're not all the same. How could the people who are so highly educated and who are supposed to be so smart and have all of these letters behind their names, these intellectuals, how could they be so wrong. Because we realize at some level, uh, when you stop and think about the concept of evolution, we realize it's almost laughable. Or, let me say it this way, if I really tried to convince you that evolution was a fact, you would want to laugh me out of the room. And I'll illustrate this way. This, way. this is my iPhone. Is there any way that I could ever convince you that this just happened? If I really tried to make a case that this somehow, some way, it just magically happened, you would laugh me out of the room, and you should. But the human body, your human body, my human body, much more complicated. This iPhone, it does a lot of things, and it may sometimes feel like it is our significant other, but it's not even alive. You know how it is. If you leave home without it, you feel like you've gone out undressed. It's true. It's not even alive. And so we created the iPhone, but we who are much more complicated than the iPhone just happened? It's ludicrous. And that's next week's lesson. Josh will do a great job talking about intelligent design. And... Maybe that's what creates doubt within us. Everywhere we go, except church, and sometimes even in church, evolution is referred to as fact. 
everybody knows it's true. It's the only logical source of origins. It's just, it's the way that it has to be. That's how people talk about it. That's how they talk about it on TV. I was talking to a lady last weekend at church, and, and she said, even in a Bible class, this came up, and, and, and she said, we've got to go with what God says. And, and, and one of the other teachers in the class said, well, now, hold on. I'm just not so sure about that. So sometimes, even at church, we're not so sure that we don't want to talk about evolution like it's fact. And so we, sometimes we end up having some doubts. Think about how things worked when we were very young. Early on, we begin to learn that there are certain people in life that we ought to be able to trust, that we do trust, that we love very much. That begins with our parents. When our parents are raising us up, they teach us things, we trust them, we, we count on them to tell us things and teach us things that are true, that are true, and, and that's how it ought to be. And then we come to church and we sit in Bible classes and, and some of you, no matter what your age, you can think back to Bible classes that you sat in with teachers when you were very young and some of the life-changing things that they did for you. We, we love our Bible class teachers and we should. And then we go to school. And we're taught that when we go to school that, that those who are going to teach us in school, we're thankful for them and we learn to love them and we're taught that we ought to trust them. And again, same thing as with Bible class. No matter what your age, some of you can think back to, to elementary school teachers who made a profound impact on your life. You will love them forever. And you should. I'm thankful that we're going to have a teacher in the family soon. That excites me because our teachers are very important. But the problem is, one day we go to science class, and this teacher, who we have been taught that we ought to be able to trust and take great confidence in what they're telling us, this science teacher is suddenly telling us things that, that are clashing against, that are diametrically opposed to everything we've been, been taught by our parents, by our Bible class teachers, since we were old enough to come to church, since we were old enough to understand the creation story, that's what we've understood. And all of a sudden, this person that I trust is telling me something that's completely different than all these other people that I trust. And even at a very young age, we realize that both things cannot be right. They just can't. And so the big question becomes, do I regard as garbage the things that the people at school that I trust are telling me, or do I regard as garbage the things that the people at church and at home, the things they're telling me? Which is it? Or can I find a way to harmonize the two? Can, can I find a way to make the oil and the water kind of work together? The two conflicting teachings, because if I can harmonize them or, or use them both in some way, it'll help relieve this conflict that's going on in me. You know, if I can put them together, then, you know, less conflict's better, so maybe that's the answer. And see, that gets us to theistic evolution. As we get to this, I first want to thank all of you who um, participated in the brief survey uh, that went out. And if you're thinking to yourself or if you're saying, well, what survey was that? Um, you need to get on the, the church email list. And several weeks ago, uh, the church office for us, they sent out a four-question survey. And I was very encouraged by that. We didn't send reminders. We sent it out one time, and 39 of you all uh, responded to that survey so I was very encouraged by that. Some of you offered comments and dialogue, and so I thank you for helping provide information that's, that's of use to us tonight in the lesson. My one regret in putting the survey together is that we did not include or ask for age ranges. And sometimes survey data is very, very more valuable if you can parse it by, is there a certain age that's responding in a certain way? And we didn't include that. I would do that if I had to do it over. But thank you for being involved. Theistic evolution is the tension-reducing, make-me-feel-better, compromise solution for origins. Well, let's define it a little bit. Uh, the word theistic is from the Greek word theos, which you probably already know means God. And so when a person says they believe in theistic evolution, what that person is saying is that he or she believes in both God and evolution at the same time. So it's kind of like having your cake and eating it too. It's 
is, it's, it's an attempt to harmonize the Bible with all the smart people. And even when you start trying to define theistic evolution, there are actual several variations by the people that believe in it. They don't all believe the same thing. And so we'll kind of go through some of what they believe. Variation number one, some suggest that God created the initial building blocks of matter and then allowed the evolutionary process, including the spontaneous generation of life, to occur. So God was the Big Bang, in other words. So that's one definition from people that believe in theistic evolution. Uh, number two, others contend that God created not only the primary building blocks of matter, but also He actually intervened from time to time, even though evolution was the mode of operation. Uh, I think I read number three. Not only the primary building blocks of matter, but also life itself, and then placed into operation natural laws through which evolution operated over eons of time. So that's number two. I'm sorry, I, I read that wrong. And then number three, they argue that God not only created the building blocks, gave life a push, but he actually intervened from time to time in order to bring things to where they are. Uh, according to Bert Thompson, these folks like to be called progressive creationists. And so even among the folks who believe in theistic evolution, they're not even all on the same page. Here's my question for us. Do any of those definitions sound like, remotely sound like, the book of Genesis? And I don't think it takes very long to, to, to understand that, and we're going to read some of Genesis, but they don't sound a lot like it at all. Bert Thompson goes on to share this definition or this dialogue from some of the theistic evolutionary uh, literature that's out there. He says, Many Christians, including men of science as well as theologians, accommodate the discoveries of science in their religion by suggesting that God did not create the world in its present form supernaturally. Rather, He used natural processes as His method of creation and guided evolution to the final realization of man. In this view... Adam's body was produced as a result of the process of evolution, and God then completed his creation of man by giving him an eternal soul. The creation of life, as described in Genesis, is thus recognized to be essentially poetic, or at least to be flexible enough to permit God a wide latitude in his method of creation. Now, can we grant God wide latitude? You can shake your head yes, or you can shake your head no. And it's sort of a trick question. Can we grant God wide latitude? Why not? Well, that's true. He's God. God does what God wants to do. The only thing that restricts God's latitude is, what did God say God did? And if God said He did something a certain way, He's restricted Himself. And that's what happens in Scripture. See, I hope, you, I hope you start to see very quickly the crossroads that this brings us to because, by definition, theistic evolution is not consistent with what we'll read out of Genesis. Eve becomes this huge problem. You know, even before giving in to temptation, the, the arrival of Eve is a, is a huge problem for the theistic evolutionists because if God kicked things into motion and allowed Adam to evolve... Did Eve have to evolve also? Where was Eve? Was she evolving during the time that Adam went to God and said, excuse me, you've created a lot of stuff here, but I'm lonely. I need somebody. So when Adam says that, does God then come back and say, well, let me evolve you a woman? And if that's the case, how old would Adam have been when Eve finally showed up? Eve is a huge problem. And if we can conclude that God did take a rib from Adam and created Eve immediately for him, why would we think Adam would evolve and Eve wouldn't? There's no logic to it at all. She's a huge problem. So what do Americans believe about theistic evolution, and how does that compare with the survey that we took? For Americans who attend worship at least once a week, 25% believe in theistic evolution. So about one in four people who go to church once a week believe in theistic evolution. 67% believe in the creation of the universe within the ten, last 10,000 years, in other words, a young earth, 
which is what the biblical record would support. The survey data goes on to say in America, the less you go to church, the more likely you are to believe in theistic evolution. Uh, For us, out of the 39 who responded, only 10% of those responding said that they believe in theistic evolution. So yes, you're going to church with people who say, I believe in theistic evolution. You might be mind blown if we all knew what each other believed. We really would. About everything. 62% of us said that we do not believe in theistic evolution, and 28% said, I'm really not even sure what theistic evolution is, which means that it's valuable to look at this stuff. The next question, 85% in our survey said that they believe that the earth is not more than a million years old. In other words, 85% of us said, hey, we believe in a young earth. We believe in what the Genesis, the, the biblical record re- would support related to how old the earth is. Uh, 5% uh, were unsure. 82% of us responding to the survey said that we believe the days referenced in the creation narrative are actual 24-hour days. 13% of us were unsure. And then finally, 67% of us said that we believe there are, there are major implications regarding whether or not a Christian believes in theistic evolution. 23% of us were not sure. And, and we're going to camp out on that question here uh, before we get done tonight. What our survey tells me is that that Trey and our shepherds were very wise in deciding that we ought to spend a summer uh, answering atheism and thinking about these things because we serve a God who intends our faith to be rock solid. We serve a God who intends us to know that we know. We serve a God who intends us to have a very, very strong faith you may remember 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, where Paul writes, For this reason I also suffer these things, but I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I believed, and I'm convinced that he's able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. We've entrusted something very important. We've entrusted our internal destiny to God, and he wants us to know. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. There's evidence for our faith, and God wants us to be rock solid in that. So let's spend a few minutes talking about what's at risk in Scripture if we embrace a model whereby God does just enough to get things started and then allows evolution to take over uh, from there. First, we've got to decide... Whether the days of creation were literal 24-hour days as we know them, or whether they were some nondescript periods of time, as the the evolution crowd would have us to believe. And I I want to go to Genesis chapter 1, and I I debated on how much of this to read, and the more I thought about it, it, I thought we may end up reading the whole chapter, because familiar text can be very frustrating for those of us as we study. It can be very frustrating for those of us as we teach because a familiar text, we, we've read it before, and I'm going to read it, I'm going to skim it, I may not get anything new out of it. It's very familiar. We've been doing this one since we were little kids. But I want to read through this. And as we read through it, I want you to think in terms of, okay, is God writing in figurative language? Does this sound like a narrative? Does this sound like God trying to communicate to me something that actually occurred? And are there things in it that might lead me to believe that things happened over long periods of time? Or does it sound a lot like when God said it, it happened? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Sounds like a pretty definite action. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And then there's this phrase, and we're going to talk more about that, and there was evening and there was morning, One day. If it doesn't mean a day like we understand a day, why would God say it this way? 
Verse 6, Then God said, Let there uh, be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. Sounds again like a very definite action. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning, a second day. Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the land appear. And it was so. God called the, the, the dry land earth, and the gathering of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees in the earth bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them. And it was so. Does that sound sudden? Or does that sound gradual? The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind, and God saw that it was good. There was evening, and there was morning, a third day. Then God said, let, the, let there be lights in the expanse in the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let there, there be for the signs and for the seasons and for days and for years, and let there uh, be for lights, excuse me, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, and it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give them light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw it was good. There was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. I hope reading this doesn't bore you because a lot of people have staked an eternal future on something it sounds completely different than this. Verse 20, Then God said, Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves. Every living creature that moves. With which the waters swarmed after their kind, and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. Sounds like God is putting everything in place. At the same time, at least in my reading of Scripture, God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. There was evening and there was morning, a fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind. <coughs> Excuse me. Cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. If God created Adam and, and told Adam that Adam was to rule over all of this that had been created, who was ruling over until Adam got there? God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Huh. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I've given you every plant, yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Now notice chapter 2, verse 1. Then the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts. Sounds like God took some very specific action, and then God said, it's done. 
By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. I know that's a lot of reading, but I wanted to read through it with the idea, let's, let's think about, does this sound like something that's happening in the moment, or does this sound like a, a, a poetic, figurative... It doesn't sound figurative, and it doesn't sound poetic. If you want a poetic view of creation, go to Psalm 104, where you kind of get some poetic language about God creating. This isn't that. This is a narrative. Now, to be fair... Just because we see the word day in a verse, it doesn't mean we can understand without understanding context what day means. And I'll give you a couple of quick examples. Genesis chapter 7, verse 24. The flood has occurred and they're waiting for the water to go down. And uh, we're told in Genesis chapter 7, verse 24, that the flood waters were there for 150 days. Well, based on the context, we get a pretty good idea that God is trying to communicate to anyone who would read Genesis how long that water was on the earth. Not a nondescript period of time. We understand 150 days. That's a long time for water to be somewhere. But we understand the context. Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 17, though, uses day in a different way. Uh, God is foretelling how Israel is going to break his covenant. And he makes a statement where he says, Then my anger will be kindled against you in that day. Well, that's not a 24-hour period. When, when you reach that point where you've done wrong and you've made me mad in that day, whenever that occurs, so we understand from the context, the word day there is used very differently than in Genesis chapter 7, verse 24. The question is, how is it being used in the creation account? Eric Lyons tells us that, that, that one indicator from Scripture by the scholars who have looked at it, when you see the Bible say there was evening and there was morning, it happens about 348 times. And I'm glad there are people that like to go through and count. Because 348 times, and in all but maybe two cases, the context tells us it's a 24-hour period. There's a place in Genesis 49, verse 27. There's a place in Habakkuk 1.8 where... Uh, there, there's prophetic, figurative language going on in the context, and so a day in those two places might not mean 24 hours, but any other time you see evening and you see morning, it's a day. In the creation account, if days don't mean days, why would by inspiration God have had the account recorded this way? This book is for us. God was trying to communicate something to us. What would be the point of, of, of him using something that, that makes no sense? Would he want to confuse us on purpose? Would he want to mislead us? How old was Adam one minute after God created him? It's not a trick question. He was one minute old, wasn't he? How old did Adam look? one minute after God created him? Well, the Bible doesn't exactly say. Day three, God makes all this vegetation and all these plants and everything. Day six, Adam shows up. So three days later, these things that were created, they've got to be able to feed this guy. I suspect they didn't look like little seedlings on day three. People want to do all this thing with age and how old stuff looks. We don't know how old God made this place look when he created it. But we know one minute after Adam was born, he was one minute old. But we know he didn't look one minute old. And we know God created a place that was perfect and it was there to support him and to take care of him. Finally, those who want to make the case for the days of creation representing these nondescript periods of time, one of the things they'll do is they'll go to places in Scripture, maybe places like Psalm 90, where the Bible says something to the effect, well, you know, with God, a thousand years is like a day. And, and they'll say, see, God, he, he does time differently than we do. Well, have you ever read Psalm 90 and looked at the context there? 
That's a psalm attributed to Moses. And what Moses is trying to do in that psalm is he says, you know, he said, if we would look at time more like God does, he said, you know, we, we look at the 70 or 80 years that we spend here and we put all of our energy there and all we think about is the time here on earth. And Moses is trying to say, God looks at, you know, a thousand years to God is like a night, a night watch. And if we would think of forever more like God does, we might just live better lives. That's Psalm 90. It has nothing to do with God having eons of time and calling them days to confuse us. The other thing we've got to do is we've got to decide whether other people in Scripture you know, had a bunch of uninspired moments, whether they'd simply been misled regarding what to believe. Think about Moses. Think about Exodus chapter 20. You know what's going on in Exodus chapter 20. God is giving the law, and, and Moses has these tablets of stone, and he, he's coming down, and, and, and he's communicating God's will in verse 10 of Exodus 20. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you nor your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord God blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Man, God gives us information that he really didn't have to. He could have just said, don't do any work on the seventh day. Instead, God said, here's why I'm saying this. Here's why I'm giving you this. Here's the background. Did Moses not know what he was talking about? Had, was God giving Moses bad information? And then the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, and I can see we're going to have to really speed up or we're going to be out of time, but Romans chapter 1, verse 20, these words are, are pretty familiar to us as well, but there's a statement here made by Paul, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, talking about God's, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world. Well, who's going to see them? Well, we are. People are. Being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. The idea is, since God finished the creation at that point, we could understand something about Him. That means creation had to be complete and we had to be there to see it. Did Paul not know what he was talking about? Is it an uninspired moment? And then Jesus himself in Mark chapter 10, verse 6, and again, these words are, are very familiar, and it's not normally the point of what we're, we're talking about, but he says in that, and I want to make sure I read it right to you, it's a very brief statement, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. So... Was Jesus himself confused about our origin? Now, some may still be thinking, okay, is it really a big deal? You know, does it really matter? You know, why can't both be valid? I know I believe in God. I know I believe that the Bible is his word. I know that I need to try to follow him. So does it really matter whether or not he created or whether he created and used some evolution? You know, does it really matter? If that's where you are, I, I want to I try to communicate and I want to challenge your thinking because I believe it's a huge deal. I believe there are huge ramifications. And the evolutionists, they know it's a huge deal and they understand exactly why it's such a big deal. Even though the idea of evolution defies common sense and it defies scientific evidence, you know, real science supports a young earth about 10,000 years old or so. The evolutionist understands that if there is no creator, man answers to no one. In other words, man is his own God. And in that, the evolutionist also understands that if we acknowledge a creator, then we've also got to acknowledge the idea that if there is a creator, we might actually be responsible to them, to him. It might be in our best interest to try to figure out if that creator has said something that we need to know. And that, friends, is the reason a hardcore evolutionist will purposefully ignore the evidence. 
And unfortunately, there are way too many good people who've heard both sides for so long and they don't like the tension and they don't like the conflict that in the end it's like, well, maybe I'll just hold on to the idea of theistic evolution that, that God is, yeah, there is God, but he, he did evolution and it's a compromise. If you don't remember anything else tonight, I want you to walk out of here remembering this. If you can get one thing, take this with you. And this is why it's important. If we can discredit God on one thing, then we're not responsible to God for anything. If we're not, if we can discredit God on one thing, then we're not responsible to Him for anything. If you haven't read Muscle and a Shovel yet, I'd encourage you to pick up a copy of that and read it. Um, it'll remind you that doctrine is important. It'll remind you that honest, open study of God's Word still works. And it ought to be a reminder to us that in a lot of cases the house is on fire and we need to be aware of that and trying to do something about it. In that book, Michael Shank uh, brings in a quote from Adolf Hitler. And the quote is, People, by means of shrewd lies, unremittingly repeated, can be made to believe that hell is heaven. Dr. Barfield used this quote in our very first week. People will believe that hell is heaven by hearing lies persistently repeated to them. And one can make the case that that's exactly what goes on in this whole debate. People with an anti-God agenda, they've repeated the lie over and over and over and stated it as fact, and they've repeated it so much that good-hearted, well-intentioned believers in God have accepted the lie just because everybody talks about the fact that everybody knows it's true. In other words, hell has been made to become heaven. And again, the problem is, if we discredit God regarding what He said He did in creating, we can then begin to pick and choose on the other things that He said, and we can take what we want, and we can leave what we want. Same thing with the writings of Moses. The same thing with the writings of Paul. The same with Jesus Himself. Think about it. The Great Flood. You know, even though scientific evidence supports the idea of a catastrophic event where the flood fits the evidence perfectly, you know, maybe that didn't really happen. And that parting of the Red Sea thing that, that we read about God saving His people and it talks about them, uh, the, the seas parting and them crossing and going through on dry land. Well, you know, maybe that wasn't really a miracle and maybe it wasn't really dry land. Maybe it was just a shallow spot and you know, maybe God didn't really mean what God said there. Maybe there wasn't a virgin birth. You know, maybe it was a big cover-up. Maybe Joseph had been with Mary and they covered the whole thing up. And maybe Jesus was just a man with some good ideas. Maybe he really wasn't the Son of God. And then we were going to read about what Jesus said he did. And, you know, he did some miracles, but maybe they weren't really miracles. You know, he raised that man called Lazarus. Four days he'd been dead. Well, you know, maybe that was a cover-up. Maybe he hadn't really been dead four days. Even though we know they went in the tomb the first three days, you went in there every day because sometimes you threw somebody in the tomb and they really weren't dead, and you went in and you checked on them for three days in a row. Maybe it didn't really happen that way. After all, who could be actually raising someone from the dead? And of course, the next step is the risen Jesus. You know, maybe that was a big hoax. Maybe the body was stolen. Maybe they took the body away and started a big story. The other thing that happens is if I can begin to invalidate and discredit what God said God did, the next logical step is to invalidate and to begin to discredit what God said God wants. Because after all, if I can't count on Him having done what He said He did in creating and anywhere else, I mean, how can I trust that He's told me what He really wants me to know about following Him? You know, even though that idea of accepting Jesus as my personal Savior, any, even though that's not really in there, and, and even though that, you know, that sinner's prayer thing, that sounds really good, it sounds really convenient, it sounds like a lot less trouble than submission and obedience and baptism. And there sure are a lot of people that, that believe in that and follow that. So, so maybe God didn't really mean that we contact the cleansing blood of Christ in the waters of baptism like the Bible says we do. It sure would be a lot less tense if we could accept any plan of salvation. Maybe God just wants sincerity. 
If we start trying to discount what God has said, all we end up with is problems. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful to anyone, but I want you to understand the issue. A belief in theistic evolution, it is a compromise. It's telling God that we don't believe what he said. And if we discredit God on one thing, the buffet is wide open for business. And from there, it's Katie bar the door. And please allow me to remind you of something that Steve mentioned last week. We've already, people who call themselves Christians, when anti-God people look at us, we've already got a credibility problem. One of the morning guys I listen to on ESPN radio, he is, by his own admission, an agnostic, meaning you can't know or not know there's a God. He's a skeptic. But he knows enough Bible to know that when he looks at people who call themselves Christians, he looks at us and, and he says, you've got a real credibility problem because you treat following God like it's a buffet. Now, I like a good buffet, a good Chinese buffet. It makes me hungry. I could go eat now. I didn't go with the Golden Corral guys, sorry. We pick and we choose. That's what Steve talked about last week. Well, God said this, and I like that, and I agree with that, so I'll, I'll, I'll get some of that. But over here, I don't know about this. God has challenged me here. I like the way I do things. I'm not so much inclined to follow him over here. And so when we start treating it like a buffet, people who maybe otherwise would follow God don't, unless people are converted as we conclude tonight, people who have been bombarded with false information, people who believe in God who have been bombarded by false information, they've been done this, smart people with an agenda have done much harm to us. And many people have heard the false information so frequently that they've begun to believe that it's true. Christians who teach science in public school venues and in universities, that they are put in a, an unenviable position. Teach a real origin explanation or teach the big lie. And thankfully, there are some who, Christians who honor God who are still able to get away with teaching evolution as an unproven theory and maybe even be a little bit more bold than that. I'm thankful one thing we need to do, I want to challenge us to become students of the evidence and not believe ungodly scientists simply because they may happen to be the most educated people in the room in any given moment. And what you're going to find out as you begin to become a great student of all of this, you're going to find out that there have been many, many well-known scientists who are actually creationists, God-fearing creationists. And some of the names are names you're going to recognize. ApologeticsPress.org, it's an excellent resource. I also want to challenge us to embrace the idea that both things do not have to fit together. And we've got to get comfortable with the tension. And we've got to get comfortable with the idea that it's never going to be peaceful in that regard, but we'll find our peace in holding on to a very confident faith through the tension. Theistic evolution is a God-denying compromise, and it just will not work. Third... We've got to decide whether what we believe God said is what God actually did. You know 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, but sanctify Christ in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Man, that last part of the verse is so very important. If we're going to be effective in, in helping others want to find the evidence and see it for themselves, that gentleness and that reverence, that respect, that love is going to be huge in helping us be successful. As some of you commented when you took the survey, it truly is all or nothing as it relates to God. We either take everything He said or we take nothing because truly... If we discredit him on one thing, we're not responsible to him for anything. And the Bible says that we're responsible to him for a lot. It tells us that he sent a son, a son who died on a cross, a son who willingly gave his life so that we can be in heaven one day and don't have to be lost. 
Thomas is going to lead us in a song of invitation tonight, and your response to the lesson can be multiple. You know, there are multiple ways to respond. One is, I need to become a student of all these things. I need to get the doubt out of my mind. And if you'll study the evidence, you can get rid of the doubt. The Bible always wins. The Bible never lets anybody down. Maybe you're here tonight and your Christian walk isn't what it needs to have been. Maybe when we talked about that buffet approach or you think back to what Steve talked about last week with the way we pick and choose our morality, maybe some of those things are, are weighing on your mind and maybe you realize, you know, I, I need to have a better walk with God because people don't see what they need to see in me. If you're a Christian here tonight, our shepherds can pray with you and for you. Maybe you're here tonight and you're not a Christian. And there would be nothing better than for us to stay however long it takes to see you immersed into Christ, to begin your walk with him tonight, baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. How's your walk with God tonight? If you need to respond, please let that be known. Please come to the front while we stand and while we sing. Let us haste, oh haste to its brink. Tis the fount of love from the source above, and he bids us all freely drink. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call, tis a fountain open for all. There's a living stream with a crystal gleam from the throne of life. Now it flows while the waters roll, let the weary soul call that forth freely goes will you come to the fountain free will you come tis for you and me thirsty soul hear the welcome call Tis a fountain open for all. There's a rock that's cleft, and no soul is left that may not its pure water share. Tis for you and me, and its stream I see. Let us hasten joyfully there. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all.